excited that this morning you're going to get to hear Dan Bouchel, Executive Director of Missions Resource Network, great preacher, good friend, and he and Amy are now new members of the Hills. So he will be speaking today not just as some expert from the outside, but he'll be speaking as one of us who wants to see us become our very best selves. So listen to Dan, but even more, listen as the Holy Spirit touches your heart this weekend to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. God bless. I was sitting in a very nice office across from a wealthy individual in the business community who had tremendous potential as a donor and cared about uh, the kingdom, cared about the Lord. But I had a hard time believing my ears when he looked me in the eye and he said, okay, so if I make a gift to MRN, exactly what will that produce? What's the bottom line in terms of dollars per soul? And I... I thought for a minute, excuse me, how would you even begin to calculate that? You, you know, we, we train missionaries, we support missionaries, we train churches to support missionaries, we connect them all. We don't do frontline evangelism. Does that even count toward the bottom line? What about the dollars that are given to the churches that support, by the churches that support the missionary? How, how would you even begin to calculate a thing like that? And, and I was just kind of stunned. He was wondering, is this a, a good investment? Does it pay off? But I, I understand the question and the mentality. I've heard things like this for years. I will never forget here some years ago in another church where I was working after we'd had a big missions presentation, one of the members came up to me and he said, all right, I've been doing the math and we've been supporting this particular mission effort for so many years and it's cost us this much a year and you calculate that out per year and we're claiming we have this many Christians there and it's costing us so many thousands of dollars per soul. I don't think that's a good return on our investment. I think we'd be better off investing that money here. I've heard this for years. People who say, I don't know why we're spending all that money sending our young people all over the world when there's so many people right here in our own country who don't know the Lord. And you know, anybody who has supported global missions and churches have heard comments like this for many, many years. And you know, that's why I'm so glad to be a member of the Hills. Because frankly... You know better. You know that this idea that's so common out there that investing in God's global mission reduces our ability to invest locally is just a lie of the devil. You know better. You trust the promise of Jesus that God gives more to churches who give themselves away to others. You believe Jesus when he says, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured out into your lap. You believe Jesus when he says, if you seek to save your life, if you try to grasp onto your life, you will lose it. But if you will give away your life, if you will give away yourself for my sake and for the gospel, you will find it. You understand At this congregation, you understand, we cannot obey the command of Jesus to go make disciples of all nations if we can only see in our own backyard. And trust me, I see the difference because I work with churches all over this country and frankly, around the world. And about two Sundays a month, I'm somewhere else in another congregation helping them with their missions in some form or another. And this congregation really stands out. That's why this congregation has Servant Weekend for the less fortunate, not only here, but abroad. That's why we have a goal this year of $1.674 million for Harvest Weekend, because we want the whole world to hear. That's why 50%, 50 cents on every dollar given in this congregation goes outside this congregation to serve people who are not members here, people in this community and people in various stages as distance from us in our region, in our nation, and around the whole world. And frankly, when my family and I moved here a little over a year ago, about 15, 16 months ago, and we were looking for a church and we visited different places, 
there were a lot of things about this church that we liked. A lot of wonderful programs. It's good for our daughter, and we like the worship, you know, and Rick's okay. And, and there's just so much that we enjoyed about this congregation. But what really clinched it for us was the global vision of this church. Because as a congregation, you understand that God's mission to save the world is not a parasite that comes in from the outside, sucks the lifeblood off of this congregation and takes it somewhere else. But the God's global mission is the bone marrow that creates the blood that gives life to the whole body. You understand everything is mission. You understand that God's global vision for us as a church and creating a global footprint as a congregation unleashes pit ump energy within the congregation because it has the potential to grab people's hearts and minds and get them excited about being a part of what God is doing. And instead of buying another big screen television or another new car or some other frivolous thing, we see the value of investing globally. And not only do we unleash more resources, but we're reaching out and we're bringing more people who bring their resources as they get caught up in this global mission God has to redeem his world. But even though you get that, even though you understand that, I wonder if any of us really grasp how important this is to God and why it is so important to God. Because God's plan of redemption is not just a numbers game. It is bigger than that. It's not just about how many individual souls God can get into heaven. As if we just need to go to those places in the world that are most responsive and just get as many numbers as possible. No, it's not just a numbers game. God is interested in more than just how many people are saved. He wants representatives from every nation, every race, every tribe, and every language. And it is critically important to his vision for his saving of the world. This has been the case ever since he called Abraham, which follows immediately after the Tower of Babel, where because of the great sin of humanity, God had to scatter all the peoples of the world to reduce our ability to do evil in the world. And he creates all these different languages so that we can't cooperate to do great evil in the world to the same level. But then immediately he calls Abraham. And he calls him from the major population center at that time in the world history, which is at the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates in what is today Iraq. And he calls him to leave that major population center. And he says, I want you to go to a land I'm going to show you, a land that Abraham had never seen, never heard of. And, and he says, I'm going to turn you into a great nation. I'm going to give you this land. And then he says, everybody who blesses you, I'll bless. Everybody who curses you, we curse, you'll curse. But he says, then you will be a blessing. And all nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And he locates Abraham and his descendants at the crossroads of the ancient world. He locates them on a tiny strip of land between the Mediterranean Ocean and the desert. It was the only way to get from the major population center of the Fertile Crescent to the major population center of North Africa. And all of the world traveled that road on a trade route. And every part of the world had to come to know about Palestine, had to know about Israel because they all traveled through there. And God locates his people right there where all nations of the world can see them. He develops them into a nation. He gives them a law to to show the world what life could be like if the world submitted to God's ways and lived with him as their God. And that's why the prophets have all these annoyingly long chapters that you have to wade through if you read your Bible every year. These annoyingly long chapters about the oracles to foreign nations, and you're like, I don't really care what God had to say to ancient Egypt. I don't really care what God had to say to ancient Assyria. Why should I care about Moab? Why should I care about Edom? They don't even exist anymore. And yet, God cared because God had a vision for all nations. For example, look at what it says in Psalms. Chapter 86, verse 9. This is so common in in the Psalms and the prophets. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. All the nations are going to come and assemble before God because Israel is going to draw them. Or look at Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 8. On this mountain... The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for who? All peoples. A banquet aged wine. Now, for those of you who don't drink, that's the good stuff, okay? 
the best of meats, the finest of wines. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. What shroud? The death shroud. The sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. That's why it was so important on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was preached the very first time. It wasn't just 3,000 people that were baptized. It wasn't just the number. It's where all they came from. Listen and read back in Acts 2 about how many nations were represented there. There's something like 26, 29, I'm, I'm not good with math, nations represented on that day. And they all come, and it's the opposite of the Tower of Babel story. Because in the Tower of Babel story, because of sin... Everybody hears in a different language and nobody can communicate. But now on this day, when Babel is undone, everybody hears the good news in their own language and they're all united and people from all of these nations come into the one kingdom. It's not just about a number. It's about the uniting of the nations, a symbol of what God has been up to from the beginning. You see, that's why, for example, that Paul emphasizes over and over again in his writings That in Christ, though we come from many different nations and many different backgrounds and many different social classes and even different genders that are often at war with one another, we're all one in Christ Jesus. For example, look at Galatians chapter 3. And at the end of Galatians, Paul, this whole letter is dealing with the issue of the racial and cultural tensions that are breaking up the church. And he says, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you, all nations, all groups, all countries... We're baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's not addressing tensions in the church because we have different opinions about what kind of music we like to sing. He's talking about the things that break up churches because of the different nationalities, cultures, languages, and perspectives that represent the different people groups that make up the church. Or look, for example, at Romans 15, where after six chapters of dealing with this Jew-Gentile thing very directly, and really the whole letter deals with this, he says in chapter 15, at kind of the zenith, the climax of the book, he says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. And here's the vision that drives it all. So that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God is seeking. People from all groups, all nations, all cultures, together with one mouth and one heart, in unity, in beautiful harmony, singing the glories of our great God and King. You know, that's why every one of us longs deep in ourselves for more than just a nice personal experience in life or a nice little neighborhood. That's why we all long to be part of the healing of the world. That's why people who don't even know Jesus, when they see stories on the news about catastrophes and disasters and tornadoes and earthquakes and tsunamis, their heart goes out and they want to do something about that because there is something buried deep within them of the Spirit of God that longs for the world to be set right. And we all inside just get angry. And at times we just tremble with frustration over the brokenness of the world and the way that it is, and we want to be a part of fixing it. But you know what? It's not just we who tremble inside. So does all of creation. According to Romans, verse, uh, or chapter 8, verses 18 through 23, these are my, this is my favorite section of Scripture right here, where Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation, do you hear that? The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. 
We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. All of creation, all of creation trembles and longs for things to be set right. It's not just human souls that will be saved. God is going to redeem and restore all of his creation. You see, when we as God's beings made in his image rebelled against God's authority and stepped out from underneath authority, God didn't curse us. He cursed the ground in Genesis 3. And therefore, the ground rebelled against our authority because we were not under God's authority. And the creation fights against us with disease and death and tragedies and natural disasters, rebelling against us, reminding us of our inadequacy to rule our world. And we try to rule it, but it won't submit to us until we submit to God. And then like Jesus who can walk on water, who can, take, who can change water into wine, who can multiply loaves and fishes, all of nature will submit to us when God sets all things right. But there's this common false belief out there that the nations don't matter to God and that creation doesn't matter to God. Only individual souls, only the spiritual part of us matters to God. And that what God really wants is to yank our spirits out of our bodies, yank our souls out of our bodies, toss our bodies aside and burn them up, and just take our souls off to some spirit heaven somewhere. Well, that's not a biblical vision. That's not the Christian message. That's more Eastern mysticism. That's more Hinduism or Buddhism. No, our bodies matter Creation matters and nations matter. Our gender, our race, our nation, our language, our histories, we don't shed them and just become free-floating spirits off somewhere in heaven. That's not like our bodies are just the shell of the peanut that we can trample on on our way out of the restaurant. No, God wants the nut. He wants you, the nut. He wants the whole thing. And everything that makes us human is not left behind so that we become angels in heaven. I, don't, I, I know the movie It's a Wonderful Life is a great movie, but its vision of the end times in heaven is completely wrong. The biblical picture involves the resurrection of our bodies. And just like Jesus' resurrected body bears the scars of what happened to him, so your body bears its culture, its history, its significance. You retain your identity. Yeah, it's a perfected body, but... It's the same resurrected body transformed and perfected. And that means that Rick gets to stay a white male Texan forever. I'm sure he's very relieved about that. You see, in the biblical vision, God likes his earth. He said it's good. He's not going to let the devil have it. He's going to redeem the whole world. He doesn't want to destroy it. He wants to fix it. And that's why I love this picture. And somehow, I don't know why we don't get this, but look at Revelation chapter 21. Look at this vision. I saw a new heaven and a new... I I didn't write the Bible. A new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now that doesn't necessarily mean a new planet. It means a renewed planet. Keep reading. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming... What direction? Down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and he will be with them and be their God and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What's passed away? The old order of things. And then listen to this language. He who is seated on the throne says, I'm making everything new. He does not say, I'm making all new things. He says, I'm making everything new. I'm restoring it to its mint condition. You see, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and earth and heaven that have been divorced, separated, and at war with one another since human rebellion get remarried. And the barrier between heaven and earth is eliminated. And the ability to cross between one and the other is restored. And God is right there in our midst. And in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul talks about our resurrected bodies being spiritual bodies, he doesn't mean they're composed of spirit. 
any more than a gasoline engine is composed of gasoline or an electric engine is composed of electricity. A spiritual body is a body that is fueled by the power of God's spirit because your body was created to be a temple that houses the Holy Spirit and is empowered by the Holy Spirit, but your body's cracked and leaks and it doesn't hold it very well right now. But see, God made the whole world good. And he's going to restore it, not throw it in some cosmic disposal and flush it. He's not going to let the devil get his creation. He's going to redeem it. And it all the whole creation just cries out longing for that day. And the most beautiful part of the vision is captured in Revelation 21 at the end and beginning of chapter 22. And starting in 21, 22, John writes, I did not see a temple in this city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And notice the nations. The nations. They're not eliminated. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gate ever be shut, for there will be no nor night there. And the, glo- the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And no longer will there be any curse on the earth. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him and they will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night. And they'll not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever, reigning over a renewed and perfected creation, but not eliminating their national identities, but retaining them and bringing the best of all of them. People from every nation, race, tribe, and language will come together as one people in the new heaven and new earth to live together with God in their midst, retaining the best of every culture. This is not like the American idea of the melting pot where somehow our cultural distinctivenesses are eliminated. No, the nations bring all the beauty and all the treasures of all their cultural heritage into the renewed creation to be put on display forevermore. And since human beings are made in God's image, even people who don't know him have the capacity to create beauty, which is a praise unto his glory and creative power. Every single culture in the world from every country has a cultural heritage that is worth preserving and renewing. There is creative beauty in every culture. And all the good stuff gets brought into the final kingdom of God. And that's why God is determined to bring in representatives from every people group. To bring the best best of every culture into a perfected world. Because he doesn't want any people group to not have their glory and beauty on display as an expression of what he has done in them and through them. Because he loves them. Now just think about the significance that gives to us as human beings. We can actually do things and create things that have eternal significance. That's amazing. You think maybe that's what Paul had in mind partially when he talked about laying by in store and our good works following us? You know what I think that means? I think that means that the compositions of Bach and Mozart get played for all eternity. I think that means that the lyrical beauty of Spanish and Italian are spoken forever. I think that means that the artwork of all the countries of Africa and Asia and India will hang on the walls of Jasper and Carnelian. I think that means that guacamole will be available forever. (laughs) God's grace and beauty are found in every single culture in unique ways. William Easterly in his book, The White Man's Burden, writes this, Heaven is where the chefs are French, the police are British, The lovers are Italian, the car mechanics are German, and it's all organized by the Swiss. Hell 
is where the chefs are British, the police are German, the lovers are Swiss, the car mechanics are French, and it's all organized by the Italians. (laughs) Appropriate for this week, don't you think? One of the great things about my job is I get to travel the world. And I just love to go and soak up the beauty and the goodness of every culture in every country. For example, this last summer, my wife and I got to go to Rwanda and visit the team you support there. And you just need to experience firsthand the dancing of the Rwandan people. They dance like no others. They dance with an enthusiasm. I went and preached in a church that had at one time been a kind of a Pentecostal church, Church of Christ Preacher and a Pentecostal Rwandan church. I know God has a sense of humor. But anyway, I was preaching in this church, and they were just packed out, and, and man, they put on a show for us. There were five dancing choirs that performed that morning. And that was after we'd had about an hour of just congregational dancing and singing with the drums going and everything. And at one point, well into the service, which lasted three and a half hours, the pastor got up and rebuked the congregation and told them they obviously had not made us feel welcome because we were not dancing with them. (laughs) So they all had to come and love on us and hug us and kiss us. And that was pretty nice. I tried to touch the babies, but they screamed because they'd never seen a white person. They thought I was sick or something. And then we had to dance with them. I won't show you because my children have threatened my life if I do. But it's not just the dancing of the Rwandan people. It's the gentleness and the grace that they have learned through what they have suffered. They lived through that hundred-day genocide where a million people were killed in a hundred days. My translator on that day was Charles Mapindo, who's become a very dear friend. We correspond with him almost daily now. He's a survivor of the genocide. And on the drive up there, he was sitting next to my wife in the back, and I was sitting up front with Chris Shelby, and I didn't hear this conversation, but Amy told me later that he said to her, I know the people who killed my family. I know the man who killed my family. I saw him do it, and he lives in my neighborhood, and I see him all the time. But I have forgiven him. And he said to her, you know, there were some Americans here a while back, and I told them this story, and a woman said to me, well, if you can forgive the people who killed your family, I guess I can forgive this woman at church who said something that hurt my feelings. And he said, what is wrong with Americans that it's so hard for them to forgive somebody who said something that hurt their feelings? I want that kind of profound grace and forgiveness and gentleness to be preserved forever. I want the hospitality of the Latino culture to be preserved forever. In 1990, my wife and I and then our little baby girl, who wasn't yet of a year at Anna, about eight or ten months old, went to Honduras. It was our first time in Latin America, or at least outside of Mexico. And I'll never forget going to the home of the Mancara family. They were middle class, which is a very small class, pretty much at the top of that culture, particularly at that time. And to be middle class meant that their floors were concrete, instead of dirt. And they had like three rooms in their house. I will never forget, there were six of us there, Americans with Christian Relief Fund, and they sat us around a table and they provided us a meal that had meat in it, shrimp. They were tiny, but the family didn't eat. They stood behind us up against the wall and served us, and they didn't eat because this family didn't eat meat once a month. I'll never forget going out into the barrio and going up into one of these little colonias where everybody's house was just plywood. And there was this house about 8 by 10 and a family of 10 people living in there, mom, dad, the kids, and grandma. She was cooking tortillas on a 50-gallon drum that had a fire built, just turning them with her bare hands on top of the drum. And at that time, the exchange rate was a limpira for about 25 cents. And a limpira would buy one Coke, a cola. And the father who provided for this family was a street sweeper. He made a limpira a day. And the mother, and by the way, this house, the downhill side, there was a foot gap between the bottom of the wall and the floor where the wall had washed out from underneath or the floor had washed out underneath the wall. One bed. 
She takes six lempira, a week's wages, gives them to one of the children to run down to the little tienda at the bottom of the hill and buy us six Cokes and then serves us a meal. I didn't want to drink it. I felt like David when his men risked their lives to go to Bethlehem and get the water. I just wanted to pour it out, but I had to honor her. That kind of hospitality needs to be preserved forever. This last summer when I was in Thailand, I noticed the way that every single person in Thailand, whenever you, they greet one another, they put their hands together and they bow before each other. Such gentleness in service in humility. That gets preserved. The French impressionistic painters, Monet, Renoir, the beauty of that artistry preserved forever. The great Russian novels of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy preserved forever. The precision and the drive for excellence of the Japanese preserved forever. The passion for progress and the ability to work in mass to accomplish great things of the Chinese preserved forever. The ability of the Congolese people to celebrate Preserve forever. Listen, the Congolese are amazing. When we were in Rwanda, we had dinner one night. Everybody else besides us and the shoemakers uh, were either Rwandan or, or American. But, but Cephas was there, and Cephas was from the Congo. And ever, the Rwandans are very quiet. They almost whisper. You have to lean in to hear them. Very restrained, right, and very, very proper. But the Congolese, are you kidding me? They're all over the place. They're loud. They're boisterous. They're joking. They're... And the Congolese can throw a party. And if you were at the dinner the other night for harvest, you know the Congolese praise band. Now listen, you don't want anybody from my family planning a party? When I graduated with my doctorate, my parents took me out to eat along with my family. And my granddad, who was still living at the time, came along, my mom's dad. And we went to the old San Francisco cafe where they've got the woman on the big swing, you know. And she does a... My granddad sat with his back. He never saw her. He's virtually blind and deaf. He got a tiny little sirloin steak, cheapest thing on the menu. He ate it very, very slowly. He didn't say anything. Nobody really said anything to him because he can't hear or see anyway. At the end of eating his steak, he leaned back and he said, Now talk about a celebration. That's what I call a celebration. Listen, nobody from my family is going to be planning the parties. Let the Congolese plan the parties. They know how to celebrate. The opera from the Italians, the symphonies from the Austrians and the Germans, not to mention jazz and blues and classic rock from America. It all gets preserved. The best of it all. And all of these treasures and countless more will be carried into the new Jerusalem to be enjoyed forever as testimonies to God's creative power through us. And how much more appealing would our message be to all people if they understood God doesn't just love your soul, He loves your country, your language, your culture, your art, and He wants you to bring everything that's good from your heritage because He thinks it's worth preserving. And rather than exporting our Western culture to all parts of the world and asking them to give up their culture to become like Jesus, what if we sought to find what was good about every nation, race, tribe, and invite all people to bring everything that's good into the kingdom of God to display the manifold beauty of the creative power of God? So don't ask me how many dollars it takes to buy an American soul versus the soul of someone from another country. You can't put value on a single soul, but this is more than just a numbers game. This is God's mission to save everything that is redeemable from every people, race, tribe, and tongue. And God isn't in the destroying business, He's in the saving business. And here's the question before us today, do we share God's heart? It's not just do we love our children and our neighbor's children. Do we love the children of Africa, the children of Asia, the children of Europe and the South Pacific and Latin America? Do we love them enough to give and to give sacrificially? Do we long to see every knee bow, whether it's bowing on marble or carpet or tile or dirt? Do we long to hear every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord and King of kings, regardless of whatever language it is spoken to the glory of God the Father? Do we want to just eat American food in the new heaven or earth? Or do we want to keep the Thai, the Mexican, the Indian, and the Italian food? After all, John 3.16 doesn't say, for God so loved America. That he gave his one and only son. But that God so loved the world that he gave 
his one and only son. And we can't be faithful if we don't give our heart and our children and our money to serve God's global mission to save the whole world, his whole creation. And so today, let's pledge to be faithful servants of God as we give our hearts and we give our children and we give our money as long as it takes until the whole world hears. Because only then will God's global mission for saving all of his creation be fulfilled. Let's pray together. Father, we are so moved that you love the whole world. Not just Israel, not just the church, not just America. The whole world. Give us a heart that big. That all people might hear. That people from every nation, race, tribe, and tongue might bring the glory and the goodness of every people into your kingdom forevermore. In the name of Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, amen.